Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mika Shino, and I'm the Director of International Jazz Day at the Herbie Hancock Institute of Jazz. And I would like to welcome you to the conversation on film scoring with UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador Herbie Hancock, Chris Bowers, and Nate Chenin. This conversation is being organized on the occasion of the 10th International Jazz Day. International Jazz Day was declared by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization in 2011 to highlight jazz and its diplomatic role of uniting people in all corners of the globe. It is now celebrated annually on April 30th. The idea of International Jazz Day originated from the legendary jazz pianist and UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador, Herbie Hancock, who you will be hearing from today. Jazz Day is chaired by Mr. Hancock and the UNESCO Director General. And this day is now celebrated in 195 countries with events small and grand to foster intercultural dialogue and peace building through jazz. And now it is an honor for me to introduce our discussants, starting with the UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador, Ambassador Hancock. Ambassador Hancock is a true icon of modern music. Throughout his career, he has transcended limitations and genres while maintaining his unmistakable voice. With an amazing career spanning five decades and 14 Grammy Awards, including Album of the Year and an Oscar, he continues to amaze audiences across the globe. He won his Oscar for his film score for Round Midnight and composed the score for the films Death Wish and Harlem Nights. He has created powerful music, produced unexpected collaborations, and inspired generations of musicians and fans all over the world. Ambassador Hancock's gift for music is rooted in his love for humanity, and his work beyond creating art extends to his role as Institute Chairman for the Herbie Hancock Institute of Jazz. He's also the Creative Director, Creative Chair for Jazz for the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and a founder of the International Committee of Artists for Peace. And he was awarded the prestigious Le Commandeur des Arts et des Lettres by the French government. In 2011, Ambassador Hancock was designated officially as the UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador for Intercultural Dialogue. He was the recipient of the Kennedy Center Honor and was named the Norton Professor of Poetry at Harvard University. Thank you, Herbie, for being here. And thank you for all of your efforts and hard work these past 10 years to launch and establish International Jazz Day. You have impacted people all over the world and inspired them to come together through jazz. I would now like to introduce Mr. Chris Bowers. Mr. Bowers is an American composer and pianist who has composed scores for acclaimed films, video games, television and documentaries, including Green Book, which won the Academy Award for Best Picture at the 91st Academy Awards. He has recorded, performed, and collaborated with the likes of Jay-Z, Kanye West, and Jose James. He won the Thelonious Monk International Piano Competition in 2011. I remember that, it's amazing. Chris has scored a number of films, including Ava DuVernay's Netflix miniseries, When They See Us. He also scored for the film, Dear White People, Kobe Bryant's Muse, and many others, as well as for the lauded series, Bridgerton, currently on Netflix. It is a great pleasure to have you here with us, Chris. I'm a huge fan. And I would now like to introduce the moderator, Mr. Nate Chinen. Nate Chinen has been writing about jazz for more than 20 years. He was a critic for the New York Times and helmed a long running column for Jazz Times. As director of editorial content at WBGO, Nate works with the multi-platform program Jazz Night in America and contributes a range of coverage to NPR music. He is a 13 time winner of the Helen Dance Robert Palmer Award for excellence in writing. And he is the author of Plain Changes, Jazz for the New Century, which is hailed as one of the best books of the year by NPR, GQ, Billboard, and Jazz Times. Thank you so much for being here with us, Nate. I give you thank the- Thank you, Mika. Um, and thank you, oh my goodness, thank you so much to Herbie Hancock and Chris Bowers for joining us today. Um, what, a, what a treat it is to see your faces, gentlemen. Thank you. 
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I love that we're convening to talk about uh, film music because um, you've both been, you've both contributed so much in this area. And before I go any further, uh, Chris, I, I feel I need to congratulate you for an Academy Award nomination for uh, a concerto is a conversation. Um, what a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful um, short documentary film that we'll, we'll talk about a little more in a moment, but uh, congratulations, first of all. Thank you, thanks. Um, so we, we have so much to talk about, but I, I thought I would begin by asking um, a deceptively simple question, which is, um, what is it that makes a jazz artist such, a, such an effective film composer? What are the, what are the qualities uh, in the training and in the sensibility um, of an improvising musician that, that really lend themselves to this art form? Maestro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Chris. <laughs> I mean, well, I, I, I'll, I feel like, um, you know, it was interesting thinking about even having this conversation uh, with uh, Herbie or Mr. Han I want to say Mr. Hancock because I feel like my mom's listening to the conversation. <laughs> but I feel like, um, you know, the thing that unlocked uh, jazz for me was the aspect of like storytelling in the moment and accompaniment. And and I fell in love with the reason why I love being a pianist is I fell in love with with the pianists that were great accompanists. And so like my way into it was when Kelly and then Herbie and uh, Kenny Kirkland and you know these people that that um were like inventing things in in the moment and uh telling story and reacting to something in the moment and i feel like that's essentially what you're doing as a as a film composer you're you know instead of it being a horn player out in front it's it's the dialogue or the story or whatever it's happening and you know the better that that I, i've seen any musician that can uh create that context, that narrative context in a live performance or uh, dialogue kind of uh, uh, aspect, I feel like only uh, shine in like a film score space, if that makes sense. Does yeah. that make sense to you, Herbie? Oh, absolutely. I, I totally agree with, with, with Chris. Um, I, I was just thinking that because when you're playing jazz, you're constantly improvising. When you're living life, you're constantly improvising. So there's a parallel right there. We have to take whatever is coming up next. And once we hear it, respond to it in some way that we feel as individuals and as a group is appropriate. So in other words, it would make sense from what went on before. But life is like that. So these parallels between playing jazz and this uh, improvisation, being in the moment, sharing the space of the music with the other musicians in, that, in a way that it's not competitive. I mean, these are all uh, very much, uh, I feel, attached to the way life flows. And, and it, that's why it's so compelling. That's why musicians, they, sometimes they may st start, like the male musicians may start because maybe they can get some girls or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> when you're young, you know, or whatever, whatever your choice is. And, uh, but the music is so compelling that your thoughts are completely over, overwhelmed by what the essence of jazz is really about. And I, I think, uh, I mean, my limited experience in doing film scores uh, is that I, I can take that experience from playing jazz and, 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 and sometimes in the process of my own improvisations, um, there may be some visual images or colors that, uh, affect the flow of what I might compose for a scene in the film. Of course, you have to listen to the director all the time because the director's film. You know, that's, that's what I was told in the very beginning. Uh, uh, but to, to satisfy 
what you feel is appropriate and what the director feels appropriate. That's always uh, the challenge. Uh, sometimes it's uh, sometimes it's it, it, it works fine, and sometimes it's it's difficult. <laughs> Have is you found that there... too, Chris? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering about the parallel between the relationship between a composer and a director and the relationship between a sideman and a band leader. Um, is there a parallel to be made there? Because you've both been leaders and also been accompanists. Yeah, I, I think that the, um, the similarity I've seen is that the best bands, in my opinion, and really the best collaborations at the end of the day are where the band leader invites somebody to the space specifically for what they do and then allows them or, or helps provide the environment for them to uh, do what they're going to do within the context of, you know, the director's vision or the band leader's vision. But I feel like, um, the, you know, when I played with Marcus Miller, for example, it was always so amazing to me as a band leader that he was really great at encouraging us to do our thing in his context uh, and never really had comments on, you know, you got to do this this way or you got to play this this way, even if we were kind of messing up and maybe he should have told us to, to do something the way, you know, it should have been done. But I feel like giving us that freedom to express ourselves only allowed us to reach further and try harder. And I've, I've felt that in the scoring context as well, where a director is able to, uh, um, you know, of course, uh, guide me in the right direction as far as what what's best for the film and all of that. But then once we're at that point, really giving everybody the freedom to be able to express themselves. And I feel like that's where really great magic comes from. And, and um, yeah, yeah, I feel like that there's a similarity there. Yeah. I, I want to go back to some some early work for both of you um, and, and just see if there are any stories there. Um, Herbie, you, you scored uh, Antonioni's Blow Up uh, in 1966. And, um, <laughs> and so I wonder um, what you recall about that moment, like, was it was it intimidating uh, to to enter that space? You know, this is a, a time in your career when so much was happening, um, and and so I wondered, you know, uh, because this I think was the first film that you composed for, right? Yes. So, what? How did that happen, and what was the experience like? What was the learning curve? Well, first of all, I was very young. And uh, I remember my, what was the person who was my girlfriend, she and I, well, now we've been married for, it's gonna be 53 years this year. Wow. But, but back then it was before we were married. And, and we had we both lived in New York and we had gone out to Long Island on, on a weekend uh, to visit some friends. And anyway, I came back and that was a, a on my uh, answering machine, <laughs> there was a, a a message that that said uh, uh, some some somebody was calling me. Right, had tried to call me, and there was a name and a number, and I called, and it was a company, uh, a music publishing company, and uh, they they said that Michelangelo Antonioni. Uh, would like me to do the score to his film. I said, who? <laughs> I had no idea who he was. I'd never seen any of his films. And the person on the phone didn't know who he was either. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> uh, I, I asked her, who was he? She said, I don't know, but he must be some big shot. That's what she <laughs> said. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I was able to fly to London where they were shooting a film and, and um, uh, Antonioni, by the way, that was the first time that I flew first class <laughs> it was on, on that day flying to, to London with the guy who was the head of the actual music publishing company. Uh, it was MGM Music, I, I think. Um, anyway, um, Antonioni, I found out, was a huge jazz fan. You know, and, uh, and of course, I did my homework and I found out all the amazing films that he had done and his 
reputation and how he's, you know, looked up to by uh, so many filmmakers, you know, as a, a leading force. And so working with him is, there's a lot of stories to that talk. I'll, I'll leave, it, leave this at that and I'll give you the, some of the other stories as we go along. I was used to New York musicians playing who, especially at that time, were the best in the world. Uh, many of those greats also moved to other cities. That's why I'm qualifying it. Um, so um, anyway, I wrote the music and we recorded it in London, but it didn't sound like what I heard in my head. I was hearing the top jazz musicians you know, who were in New York. I, that's what I was saying in my head. And these guys were not at that level. And I wasn't happy. Antonioni wasn't happy. And so we figured out a way to get around a certain thing that um, I, I, I can't explain because it's business is involved. But anyway, I, fortunately, I wound up going to New York, re-recording it with the musicians whose sounds I heard in my head. And, and that, that's what we got on the phone. Yeah, and, that's, and the results are, you know, that's a classic recording, um, you know, and, and a, like sort of a snapshot in time, but also it, it feels, you know, it feels in conversation with the rest of your work during that period. You know, it feels very, it feels very you. Mm. So much personality comes through. Thank you. It, it, it really gave me the opportunity because it's my first film score. It gave me the opportunity to write some things that I had never, or, or certain directions I had never thought of because I didn't always have to have a bass and a drummer. Depends on the scene. And uh, that opened my head up to why can't I use that same approach in a way uh, when I'm playing with a, a bass player and a drummer? In other words, I used to think a certain way when I played with a bass player and a drummer. When they weren't there, there were some other elements that I could explore. Then I realized I could do that when, even when there's a bass player and a drummer. And it kind of elevated the number of, like my view of, of choices of how to make music. Oh, I love that, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Chris, your your earliest film work is slightly more recent than 1966, um, <laughs> and uh, and and I'll I'll you know I'll let you um, you know choose which of these to to talk about. But I'll tell you that for me, um, five years ago uh, with my children, I watched The Snowy Day. Um, oh, Awesome. And and I don't think I knew when I queued it up that you had done the music. And I remember watching this with my children and, and thinking, man, this is this is really hip. Like this is you know, this is a very 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 cool presentation. And I love the music. And then I saw your name, and I knew already that you were interested in writing for for film and television. That was my first exposure because I hadn't seen Little Boxes at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so so was this was 2016 the year when sort of it all began happening for you on this front? Uh, not, not quite. Actually, like um, at, right after the Monk competition, 2011 um, was really the, the first thing, this documentary I did about uh, Elaine Stritch. It was the uh, ah. first like feature documentary that I scored, but that came really because of the Monk competition in a lot of ways, because um, I met Aretha there and she, uh, took my information and kept in touch with me after and and we had a relationship but one of the first things she told me was to find a uh, a manager and she offered her publicist as my manager and um that woman tracy jordan heard me talk about how much i wanted to be a film composer she um uh was friends with the director of the elaine stritch thing and asked if i would um uh, if, if they would meet me and they actually brought elaine to my my uh master's recital at juilliard and um I remember her uh, being in the audience and I started playing, um, I think I maybe played like a solo piano version of Darn That Dream or something like that. And she started singing in the audience. Oh <laughs> man. Like, 
now like <laughs> wait do I start accompanying her because I feel like this is kind of like an audition for this job but also like this is my senior recital and I need to do a good job right now um but uh but that that was like my first score and that was really you know I, I'm really I'm thankful that they let me do that and and slightly embarrassed that it's like you know, a bunch of MIDI, MIDI drums and MIDI bass and keyboard, just me trying to figure out the technology and trying to figure out how to, how to get started. But that was uh, the very first thing that I, that I really scored. So that's a decade ago now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so as you, as you move forward, um, what were the, what were the main things that represented a learning curve for you? Like what, what were, what were the things that you had to put together um, as you began you know, composing in this, in this area? Yeah, I think the technology was the first thing that I, I needed to figure out and wanted to figure out. I remember even in high school, I talked so much about wanting to score films that um, uh, this woman who actually, Dee Reese, who went on to direct Pariah and like Mudbound and all these things, she, I don't even know how I met her, but she asked me to, to score her short film at the time. And I remember getting on a VHS and putting it in my VHS player and then sitting at my keyboard and being like, I have no idea how to, how to get the, this to that. And, 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 uh, and at that point I was like, I need to figure out the technology side of things. And then, um, and then once I got to Juilliard, I felt like I'm, I'm at this place where, you know, the, the best classical uh, musicians, composers and, and teachers are in the world. Let me work on orchestration and theory and counterpoint and all of that, just because my favorite, um, uh, you know, composers and musicians are so, knowledgeable beyond just um uh I, I don't know I feel like um my favorite musicians and composers have so much knowledge but then find a way to present that knowledge in the simplest like form or like just emotional form um so I wanted to try to learn all of that so I feel like those were the years that I, I focused on orchestration and and writing in the classical context um and that was really helpful as well yeah you know um there are so many different ways that a film score can illuminate um, what's happening in, in a film or, or in a television program. Um, and sometimes it edges more into the foreground and sometimes it lurks and hangs back. Um, and there's someone I, I wanted to, to ask you both about um, because we lost him last year. Um, this is Maestro Ennio Morricone mm -hmm. um, because he did, he did every version of that, right? Um, and so I wonder uh, whether he's someone that that uh, either of you have looked to as inspiration. Uh, I, I actually, not, not to a great extent. Of course, I've seen his, his films. I mean, uh, famous films. I mean, who hasn't watched <laughs> at least one of his films? Um, but, the idea, actually, film scoring, I hadn't thought much about it before. So I, I guess I'm, I'm different from Chris. I, you know, I was so into playing the piano and playing with bad bands, playing jazz. The idea of doing a film score was not in my purview. Huh. Um, but when I was being asked to do that, then, of course, I, I kind of opened the door to that. But I never thought that I would pursue it as a particular direction that I, I wanted my career to to focus on. Mm. It just when opportunities arose, you know, I, I would uh, uh, gladly do them mm. and, and and be happy about it. But because I love the challenge. Yeah, but it wasn't something film film composition wasn't something that you studied um, as you came to the table. Yeah, no, that's interesting. No, um, I, I didn't. I, did, I went to a liberal arts college, but not right. a musical college. It was liberal arts in general. Mm -hmm. Orchestration, I, I never. Yeah, I, I, I had a class in it, but in a, in a liberal arts college, that's only like a semester class, you know. <laughs> and so, I mean, you just touch on little things here and there, but yeah. because I had played with orchestras, you know, because. I didn't know. <laughs> I thought, well, I've heard the sound of orchestras before. I should be able to write for for orchestra. I, I can hear that in my head. Actually, I was able to do it. <laughs> uh, 
maybe it wasn't, you know, like any almighty corner. <laughs> But but uh, I was able to do it to to the satisfaction of of directors. But now, the orchestration isn't always done by the person who writes the score. Mm -hmm. Back in those days, I thought because I didn't know, I thought that uh, uh, it was always done by the the uh, person who's hired to to do the score. Um, and now there can be a team of of people who who do the the orchestration. Uh, but those old days were really yeah. <laughs> very different. Yeah. It's before computers, before any of the things that, that are uh, possible today. And I, I remember even doing timings when you had to have something hit on a particular moment in, in the film, <laughs> you know, and they used SMPT time code. And <laughs> we, and I still have my old book. I have a book. Oh, wow. Each, every page is a different tempo. Wow. And it, it's a it's a, a kind of a like a, a, a graph, but it, it for every beat or fraction of a beat, it tells you what the simply time code is for that tempo. I have it, it's it's like three arms length from where I am now, right in this yeah. library. Wow. And, so, and, someone and, at the Smithsonian is listening very intently right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That, that's how we used to do it. Wow. Yeah. Oh man. That was the old days. Um, so, so Chris, what about you in, in terms of, I, I guess, you know, uh, Morricone in particular, but then also any other, um, any other people who, who guided you um, early on? Yeah, definitely. I mean, going off, off of that, I feel like I've, um, uh, I feel thankful that I've always been inspired by the people that, that um, are of that time period where they, they were doing everything. Like I, I still, usually start off when I can with like pencil and paper and and um and always similarly thought that like every composer is orchestrating every single note themselves and so wanted to try to like uh live up to that um and uh and so the people that really affected me are the people that that you know you could hear that in their music like John Williams or like Quincy or uh I mean like Herbie uh, that that Gershwin's World album, as far as like you know, hearing you in a in a orchestral context with those like array, those string arrangements was like one of the hugest inspirations in in my in my life and in my like musical thinking for sure. Um, and yeah, I feel like um, the but Bob Satan did that. By the way, it was wasn't me that did the oh man, <laughs> the guy named Bob Satan. He's he's extremely talented. Yeah. Oh wow, yeah. Well, I mean, even just hearing hearing you play in that context and hearing like your your sound in the orchestral, like more cinematic space, I think was something that really changed the way that I thought. Uh, like um, the the piano or like the jazz piano sound could could fit in. Um, and then as far, as far as Ennio Morricone, I feel like um, the only I similarly haven't had that deep of a experience with his work, but weirdly, Kobe, I had a. a pretty deep relationship with him when it came to scoring where I, I scored all these audiobooks for him and scored these like shorts that he did for ESPN. And, and he would always, he basically made John Williams, my Michael Jordan in his mind, as far as like what I needed to aspire for or aspire toward, but he would always randomly like give me assignments. And one of the assignments he gave me was to study the thematic development of the good, bad and the ugly. And I feel like that was like such a huge lesson in, in taking motifs and like using motifs and just like little tiny moments to, you know, keep us tied in the character and stuff. So that's, that's one of the only things I've done a, a deep dive of with, with any of That's great. That's a pretty astute assignment. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he was a pretty astute. I actually, I remember uh, we used to talk about like jazz stuff and, and we would tell him about players and he would come back the next day having like listened to albums and like checking out uh, documentaries and like, yeah, he, he was a pretty, pretty huge student. Which is pretty wow. Yeah. You know, as you talk, as you're talking about the exactitude uh, involved in, in that entire process, you know, and I also think about Herbie, what you said about the, the time codes in that book you have, you know, it, it really underscores what a, you know, incredibly detail oriented um, art form this is, you know, um, and um, and I, I would love to hear each of you talk about that precision, that sort of micro precision, um, you know, and, and how it contrasts with, and then maybe also conforms to um, your experience as, as improvising musicians, as, you know, as jazz musicians. 
You know, I, I was thinking about, um, as you were talking, I was thinking about some things that I was told uh, in, in the beginning when I did, did uh, it didn't apply so much on, on Blow Up, but it applied uh, on the, the next films that I, um, that, that I did. And, and that is that a, a, we have two different um, uh, simultaneous uh, senses that are involved in, in a film. And you've got one is, is your ears hearing what's happening here and the, the, the music and the dialogue. And then you have the visual element. I mean, that's, so those all have to um, um, occupy the same space and, and uh, according to what the idea is in the story and what the director wants to portray, he may, this is what I was told. And I wanna ask you, Chris, is, is, does it coincide with, with what you've uh, learned and, uh, uh, from yourself and from from others who have helped helped you, uh, that that if everything that the director really wants to in a, in order to uh, kind of move the audience in a, in a certain in a certain way or toward a certain direction, if a lot of it is already taken up in what's happening visually, then you don't want the music to overload that by putting the same thing on top of that, and it, it makes it top heavy. Uh, and, and you might wanna take a, like a, a secondary or tertiary road uh, to not interfere with the weight of what's already happening. But sometimes they do want the music uh, because for example, if they've, you know, many, most of the time, I mean, they shoot the, shoot the film before they, they do the soundtrack, right? So that's, they already have that, even they, even though they can uh, make some changes, you know, by editing and so forth. But um, we, we, what I was told is, if the if the director feels the scene le needs a little more of something, and the director will say, "Can you give me more of that, whatever that is," you know, uh, then I I try to provide that in some some way. Um, is that the same experience that you have, Chris? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that um, was that term like Mickey Mousing, as far as like add, like you were saying, adding too much or adding doubling down on whatever is already there visually. Uh, I feel like that's similar to when you know somebody's soloing and as a, an accompanist, you're like playing their lines back to them, and after a while, it just kind of feels like you're not adding. There's nothing additive now. You're just kind of you know uh, like adding another layer or something which actually starts to be reductive after a while and mm -hmm. I feel like um it is really fascinating to see how even the entry point of a cue you know whether or not it, it comes in under character a versus character b and if it comes in under character a uh will feel determination but even two seconds later under character b all of a sudden it feels like oh now they're, they're being ang or, um, uh, mean or something like that like those those tiny timing things I think has been really interesting to to look at what's happened just to continue to follow the story I feel like that's where maybe there's a bit of similarity with to me like the best improvisatory settings um is that like everybody is working toward following the story and and uh and like what's being said as opposed to um you know anybody's ego essentially getting in the way and I exactly. feel like it, that's where there's a lot of similarity like um and, and also with with things not being always exact because sometimes I, I feel like the human aspect of uh it's interesting like I was working on something recently where I was hitting all these cuts and then I was still set back to listen to it and it sounded too mechanical after a while because it was hitting all of these cuts and then with that you want a moment for it to feel a little bit looser and things like that and and all of that is just continuing to again respond to what the story feels like it needs or what what uh letting that letting the emotion we get from it tell us what to do and i feel like that's the same thing in the musical process is just like letting what's happening tell us what to do that's it's so fascinating because with you know as we talk about this this precision what you're describing what both of you are describing sounds very organic you know 
it's this it's this idea of like you have to be super super detail oriented but you also have to pay attention to the to the feel you know mm -hmm. like how does how is it feeling right um and there's no way to quant quantify that it's just kind of you just know it when you know it right mm. yeah I, I i think in a way uh that there's an advantage to being a jazz musician and that, that you know when you get to work with people who are really uh, proficient in the art of, of playing jazz. And I've, I've been really fortunate. I've, I've played with you know, top people in, in, the, in the field um, that take that experience extremely seriously, like it's life or death when you're actually on the stage. You know, that's, I mean, all those people paid their money to hear what you what you're gonna play, and and and, and to, to to take it with that, you know, not be cavalier about it, but you know, just take it with a, um, with a, a, a you know, that seriousness seriously. <laughs> uh, um, so when, for example, if Miles Davis is playing something, you know, I have to decide without. It's funny to decide without thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, w whether I, I should bombard it with something or whether I should let it be, uh, carry the full weight of whatever it is that, it, that he played and have to do that in the spur of a moment, you know. Um, that's that's a, a great experience to have, and 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 I think it it, it relates to the experience of of uh, writing a, a film score at least at least from from my experience since I never really studied it, um, and I, I'd like to hear uh, what what Chris has to say about about that. Does that does that make make sense to you? And yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I I would completely agree because I feel like you know the the audience is watching the film in real time and experiencing this story in real time. So it's unraveling like a live event, even though it, you know, it might be a recorded medium, but, but as far as where we are emotionally as the story is unfolding, it's definitely happening in a similar way. So I feel like, um, you know, making those choices or being mindful of that. I keep thinking of this story that uh, I remember my freshman year at high school was like when I, when I really got, um, when I think I really decided that I wanted to like be a musician. And I remember, I asked my parents for these two albums that everybody was talking about. It was Josh Redman's Elastic and the Plug Nickel box set, the, the live oh. Plug Nickel. And I remember being like, I can't wait to get this album. And at the time, my reference for Miles was, my favorite Miles album was Live at the Blackhawk. And so I was like, oh, I can't wait to hear this. And I remember getting it like Christmas, my freshman year, and putting it on and being like, what are they doing? They're not even playing the song. Like, I don't even know what's going on. Like, and I couldn't even listen to it. And then I remember the end of my freshman year having enough like experiences and training by that point to listen to it again and being like, oh my gosh, they're like telling these stories and unraveling these pieces and coming back to them and weaving these things in the moment and like doing that as a collective. And I feel like that 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 feels like um, the way that you and, and Ron play underneath uh, Wayne and, and Miles in those contexts feels like the epitome of a, a great film score. It's just totally sub, like uh, su supporting and then and then giving, like you said, giving additional support when needed, but also just like making space when needed. And yeah, yeah, it's pretty similar. I love that connection. Yeah. Yeah, I had a similar relationship to that box set, Chris. That's the knowledge to drop on a young mind. That is, yeah. that is uh, that's the deep stuff. I have to tell you, we actually had never played like that before. Wow. What happened was we, we had a week to play it at, at this club, right? <laughs> and and when we were going there, I remember I was sitting in a car with Tony Williams. And we were both discussing that it had gotten really easy to play with Miles, like too easy, you know, too comfortable. We we knew each other almost too well. And and 
that so Tony was saying, we have to move forward. It, it was his idea. He said, I'm gonna play anti-music. Like whatever <laughs> anybody expects me to play, that's not what I'm gonna play. I'm playing the opposite of that. Wow. And and I listened to him and, and I said, you're right. I'm gonna play anti-music too. Wow. So that nobody's gonna know what I'm gonna do. And, and, and they'll have to respond to something that they didn't expect. So, and as we went into the club, uh, we told, we told Wayne and Wayne was okay. <laughs> 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 right. And we told Ron, Ron didn't, Ron didn't say anything, but yeah, but, they, but it was like, all right, you know, and then we played the first day and we expected it to sound terrible and that we were going to be using this audience as a guinea pig, but that was the only way we felt that the band could break new ground. Wow. And, and when we walked into the club, there were all these huge tape recorders there. <laughs> we didn't know that it was set up to record us wow. until we got to the club. Wow. Then we had to decide, are we going to do this or not? <laughs> <laughs> Tony said, I'm doing it. And I said, okay, Tony, I'm doing it too. But then you have the box set. Yeah. Why, why do you think that worked? Because I feel like, like you said, you could think it would be really bad. And I've been in plenty of experiences in college and, and beyond where it was really bad when we were trying to do that. Like, what do you think made it so uh, special in the first time you guys were doing that to not even like work on that? When we're talking about Tony Williams, we're talking about Wayne Shorter, we're talking about Miles Davis, and we're talking about Ryan Carter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So in other words, kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not for the faint of heart. No, yeah. but, but but they should. But, well, they should. The only way you can grow is to challenge yourself. Mm -hmm. That's that's what it was about, you know. And I, here I'm I'm playing with the top musicians. Uh, in the world at, at that time, and and I, I felt like I I have to respond to that, I, and I knew what Tony was talking about, because it was it was getting easy to make it all sound nice and cool, and, you know, and we wanted we wanted to move move forward, you know, because mm -hmm. that's that's the real fun. It is not being fun. Mm. So th that's that's when we challenge ourselves, and I have to tell you one more thing that. When the record came out, I didn't want to listen to it because I knew it was not going to sound good. <laughs> By the way, they didn't have the box set first. First, they just had one single LP, uh, which you know a lot of people don't know about that. But they, there was one single LP first, and I didn't listen to it. But then somebody called me up after a couple of weeks. I, I actually had it, but I, I didn't listen to it. And somebody called me up and said, have you listened, you know, do you, you heard the plug knuckle stuff that you guys did? I said, no, no, no I don't want to listen to it. And I forgot who told me, but they said, I think you should listen to it, wow. you know, really. <laughs> and it took me two weeks until I decided to listen to it. And I listened to it and I went, oh. <laughs> Oh, that was, it, it was raw. Yeah. But it was honest, you know? Mm -hmm. I love and, that it captures that, that moment of discovery, right? Where it's like, it is, it's so, you, you literally don't know what you're doing in that sense, you know, like in the sense that we, we're doing something, we're not sure what it is, but, we're, but we know we're doing it. And, and the idea that that was captured, it's, it's, such a, it's such a miracle that we have that, that whole box. Um, yeah, you know, you. as as you talk about that, you know, we're getting comfortable. Uh, it's getting too easy. It reminds me that there are some relationships between uh, a composer and a film director that are that you know span a long period of time. And it reminds me that uh, someone that that you both know well and and is a, a dear friend to the Hancock Institute is Terence Blanchard. 
Mm-hmm. And and his relationship with Spike Lee is, I mean, it will go down as one of the greatest composer director relationships ever. You know, it's similar to Herbie and Miles. You know what I mean? Uh, and and so I, you know, Terrence is not here, but I know you both know his his film music well. And I wonder if if you know you could talk about what makes his film composing special. And and you know, let's talk about Terrence behind his back for a moment. Basically, <laughs> yeah, we've, we've we've all had a chance to 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 listen to his his growth in 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 the medium. You know, um, I mean, he started off with amazing talent, and and it has just gotten that talent has grown exponentially over the years. It's 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 wider, covers more territory, and 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 the the melodic content is, is getting more incredible, and I'm so proud of of, of everything that he's doing in, in, in films. And sometimes I'll I'll see a film, and at the end, <laughs> it it says Terrence Blanchard, and I go, oh, I didn't know Terrence did this. That was, and meanwhile, I'm thinking. Who did this score? <laughs> Terrence, and it's like, wow, it's really fantastic. You know, he's 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 an amazing, amazing human being, amazing musician, and amazing, amazingly talented film scorer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel the same way. I, I um I feel like the his band was had a similar impact on me as far as like that plug nickel album i feel like that same way about a lot of his his bands and and um uh, i feel like he carries that same spirit into the scores that he writes where like um there's such a an emotional uh experience i think listening to the music outside of the context of the film but it also fits so well in the in the context of the film and it's really cool to see how how versatile he he is at like writing for the orchestra and going back to to more of a small ensemble thing and and blending those worlds in a way that I think nobody is, has ever done in a way that like it's so uh iconic the way the like I, there are times where I'm writing and I know that I'm writing in in the style of Terrence and I feel like that that's uh that says something when somebody like writing a voice is so iconic but then at the same time like Herbie just said you can still hear uh such different writing especially lately I feel like like the five bloods or like some of the writing in in uh, black Klansmen outside of the context of like the the main theme and all of that is great but even, like a lot of the orchestral writing and stuff that i was like wait i've never heard terrence write this way and, and yeah. uh it makes me excited to hear him hear his like opera and all the other things he's doing it's just really really mind-blowing yeah i haven't heard any of that. his operas yet but i want to hear them yeah yeah and i, I um, want to see them th- that idea of growth you know um uh let's try something, you know, let's, let's go for it. I feel like he keeps doing that. It's, it's kind of amazing when you think of, I mean, I don't even know how many films total it is now with Spike alone. And he's, you know, he works with other people, obviously too. Just this idea of like, um, it's not just another one off the assembly line. It's like, every time he steps up, it's like, you know, I'm really going to go for it. This is going to be, you know, I'm stretching myself on this one, you know, and the next one. So it's, yeah, it's really inspiring. Um, you know, I, I didn't, I, I forgot to ask about, um, about period work. Um, and, and you've both, there, there's a period that you both have focused on, um, which is basically the thirties, um, Herbie, your score for Harlem nights. Um, and then, um, Chris, uh, the United States versus Billie Holiday. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is this, this really rich period. And, and, um, in both of those works, you do things that really sort of inhabit that historical style, but then you also do things that really break away from it. So I wonder if you can talk about how you approach that, you know, especially as jazz musicians where like there's so much music from that time that you've, that, that's in your blood, you know? Um, but how do you, how do you uh, sort of strike that balance between, you know, evoking and then breaking away? Mm-hmm. Uh, 
I'm sorry, I keep going first. I don't know why is why is that? <laughs> just like, I'm so fascinated by you by what you're gonna say. I'm just like, hey, yeah, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe I better go first because otherwise I'll forget what I'm gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, um, um, in 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 a, in a film, when when it, there are things that pertain, well, and it depends on the director and depends on the film when there are, are situations that really depend on what or you and the director feel that it really depends on the music being uh, within the time frame of, of, the, of the film, um, uh, the time period of the, of the film. Um, then you, you, you look for different kinds of cues that were appropriate for that that time, you know. For example, the use of the trombone, for example, with a cup mute, mm -hmm. or a trumpet with a with a, a a cup music mute is another thing for for the 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 thirties and even even the twenties, which and those weren't used that much in the in the mid mid to late 40s and, and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the things, but also the way the, the beats are played, uh, the kind of music that's played during that, that time, um, depending on what, what, what your assignment is, you, you may have to do some research of your own as to, uh, uh, as to what the music was during that, that time period to get a, uh, a sense of it, if you didn't live in that time. Mm -hmm. um, but when the music is the more incidental music where there is um, something that's happening outside, for, for example, and you, you're looking at a landscape, the the, the music doesn't necessarily have to be from that time period. Of course, like I said, it depends on, on, on not only your decision, but the, the director's decision. Because the main thing you wanna do is to keep the audience that's present listening and watching the film. <laughs> so, so whatever can help bridge that, I, I feel, is, is, uh, uh, has a better chance of being appropriate. You know, so you can move from one period to uh, another, but I mean, it has to be done carefully. Uh, yeah. Can't just pick in anything and, you know, I can't just uh, take some crazy album. I wouldn't take some on a, in a very serious film. I wouldn't necessarily choose to take some avant-garde uh, musical idea and, and throw it throw it in there. Oh, there there may be some occasion where that is, is like a clever thing to do. I mean, look what what in, in the film two thousand and and one, what was done with that score. I mean, who who would have thought to, to use to, to to use you know classical music for for that mm -hmm. rather than some really you know space space music it was that was, that was it was so clever the way they did that yeah. anyway yeah. yeah 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 I feel the same I feel like um like Herbie was saying I think that the director at the end of end of the day is really helping um guide where we're going in that direction. And I feel like with something like the uh, US versus Billie Holiday, it was interesting um, interesting to find the sound uh, with, with Lee Daniels, the director. I think that he um, communicated to me like kind of what he wanted tonally and, and it took a while to find what we found. But I think what we really went after in the end was like almost this, um, I think looking at juxtaposing the, the sound of like old Hollywood essentially and like the, the, 
the positive like romantic aspect of that against her somewhat tragic story and I think also knowing that he wanted to do that for me it was then about having a much more like like hazy like impressionistic kind of vibe with it in style so although I might be borrowing from those things harmonically or like gesturally with the way it's orchestrated or things like that there also be some like weird things where there's a uh you know maybe like all, all the strings are like holding the notes that they land on and it just becomes this wall of sound or something like that or try to make it more dreamlike also because the 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 cinematic language that he's using kind of lends itself to that as well where there's like these surreal moments that are happening for her and all of that so you know i think it really depends on um like herbie said the, be the best way we can help tell the tell the story while making sure that uh, in, in my opinion it's it's rooted in a lot of uh the world that's been created and, and then we can you know figure out how to how to turn that on its head but i feel like it starts with like you know wh whatever the the world is in the time period you know, I, I was saying one other thing too. Uh, when I did the score to around midnight, um, I, I took on the challenge of. Uh, I started to think about okay, this is it's a period film, and it, what we love about uh, about jazz is that it is in the moment, right? So if you're not worrying about time periods, you you you're free to explore in, in a lot of different directions. Um, now, if you're trying to play a style that's not your own and from another period of time, it's not the same experience as improvising in the moment without having to worry about a time period. <laughs> and that's what makes jazz have the vitality that it has. You don't have to follow uh, anything but what you're feeling at that moment mm -hmm. in your life is your life. In the film, there are musicians in there. And I said to myself, how can I get that experience of like playing instead of maybe they're playing this tune <laughs> for the 500th time, <laughs> get it, maybe this is the, you know, fifteenth time they they played it, you know, and 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 get that feeling of 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 responding in the moment that they're living in. So I started to think maybe there's some things I can do with the chords that were available at the time period of the film, but maybe jazz musicians weren't using it as much as classical musicians. I mean, look what Stravinsky did in, in 1911 when he wrote the, the, Rite of, the Rites of Spring, right? And so, so and, and Ravel, and, and, and Ravel was already being used to a certain extent, but not as fully as it could be. So that's why I made some changes in the in the chord structure of those songs so that they would sound fresh to the musicians that are playing it. It wouldn't be like, oh, playing, you know, this old old tune another time. <laughs> you know, so so th that I, I, that's what I wanted was that that freshness. So so I just wanted to, to, to let you know that's well, and, that's why I changed that, the chords to round midnight even. Uh. That freshness I is acknowledged that carefully. In the film. It's acknowledged in the first, I think, the first scene of the film when um, when Dexter's character, you know, there's the, there's a another musician on the bed. He's like, "You still playing those weird chords, man?" <laughs> <laughs> right, he did. He did say that. That's true. <laughs> That's awesome. I didn't think of that. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks for telling me that, Nate. <laughs> I think the, the the best way to to wrap up is to note. Um, you know that that Chris has been extraordinarily busy on the on the film composing <laughs> front. You know, we mentioned the United States versus Billie Holiday, which came out, uh, you know, earlier this year, and um, and you know, we also mentioned that uh, that the the short documentary film, um, a concerto is a conversation, is is uh, in the running uh, at the Oscars. Um, beautiful, beautiful film, and I urge everyone to to watch it. 
it's it's online and it's very special. Um, and then Chris, you've got uh, you did uh, work on Respect, the Aretha Franklin uh, film that's coming this summer, um, and King Richard, uh, which is uh, about uh, Richard Williams, Venus and Serena's father and, and their their family. Um, that's coming, I guess, in the fall. Yeah. Um, these are these are high profile mm. films, and I didn't even mention Bridgerton, which you know has taken the taken the world by storm. Um, <laughs> so I mean, this is a lot. You've you've got a lot going on. Um, is is the is just the balancing of your plate? Uh, has that been a challenge, or like you know, <laughs> just dealing with all of this, all of this, these different projects, um, different styles of of composing. Um, how have you managed that? Yeah, I mean, I think the di the different styles is actually what's what's so helpful about it because I think it it keeps me um, fascinated and interested in like you know uh, trying to figure out how to represent the world for for um, Richard Williams and Venus and Serena and what that's going to sound like and and what compositional things do I want to work on that might that I, I might be able to find in the music that, that works for this this uh piece for this film and and um and then that versus like something like space jam which was like challenging to write looney tune music and and uh having to like really study a lot of carl stalling and all of that kind of writing and and uh i think yeah the different styles is actually what keeps me going because then i can kind of uh just get lost in studying i feel like those are the moments where like time stops is when i'm like studying something and like learning and 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 the uh, the curiosity is kind of going um but yeah that being said I feel like yeah the life balance is very tough I've, I've like you know I just got married last year and and uh I feel like my uh my wife even we live in the same space and and I feel like a ghost sometimes when it gets really <laughs> busy or I'm like sleeping here and there and and even just for my health I think it's been something I'm trying to focus more on trying to find time to to spend time with with family and be able to like get outside and all of that kind of stuff but i i definitely i feel so uh grateful for the work and the projects that i that are coming my way and feel again such a responsibility to like do the best i can that i'm just going right now and and then uh you know trying to plan out how to how to start to slow down i think pretty pretty soon but it's, it's been a pretty cool ride yeah well gentlemen uh this has been what a what a great fun conversation this has been. I feel like I've learned an extraordinary amount, uh, you know, and I, my hats off to both of you for, you know, the work that you've done in this area and in other areas. Um, I'm so excited about all of these projects, you know, just coming down the, the pike for you, Chris, um, and uh, Maestro Hancock. Of course, I'm excited for, for uh, any note of new music that, that you bring into the world. We're, we're excited about what's coming. Um, so I just, on behalf of, uh, of Jazz Day, the whole Jazz Day team and, and the Hancock Institute, um, thank you both for being with us today.